In this video, I will show you how to use the second derivative to find the intervals where a function is concave up or concave down. This purple function is concave up everywhere. I will abbreviate concave up like this. This red function is concave down everywhere. I will abbreviate concave down like this. You probably guessed that. Right now, this function is concave up everywhere. But imagine I took the red side and flipped it upside down. Now the function is concave up to a certain point, And then it becomes concave down. The point where the function goes from concave up to concave down is called the point of inflection, which I will abbreviate as POI. A long time ago, you should have memorized these graphical relationships between f, f prime, and f double prime. If you haven't memorized these yet, I recommend that you pause the video and do so right now. But in this video, we're going to focus on just the relationship between f and f double prime. Specifically, if f double prime is positive, the original function f will be concave up. If f double prime is negative, f will be concave down. That means we can use the second derivative to figure out on which intervals a function will be concave up or concave down. Of course, in order to find the second derivative, we must first get the first derivative. So g prime by the power rule will be 6x minus 3x squared. If we take the derivative again, we will have g double prime. So the derivative of 6x is just 6, and the derivative of 3x squared will be 6x. In order to find the critical numbers, which we will need, it's best to write this in factored form. So I see there is a 6 common to both terms. Let's pull the 6 out in front. So that's 6 times 1 minus x. I guess technically they are only called critical numbers when they come from g prime. We are dealing with g double prime. So um, we won't call them critical numbers, but we still need to find the values that will cause g double prime to equal 0 or the values that cause g double prime to be undefined. Since the second derivative is a polynomial function, there are no values that will cause this to be undefined. So we can forget about this part and focus on where g double prime equals 0. So let's set 6 times 1 minus x equal to 0. Uh, we can quickly see that the solution is x equals 1. We're going to put this number on a number line and make a sign chart. So x equals 1, we will put that on the number line here. By the way, this sign chart is going to be so simple that we almost don't even need it. But I want to go through all of the steps that you will need on future problems as well. Be sure to label your sign chart as pertaining to g double prime. Ignoring the constant, we only have one factor to worry about, so we only need one row on this sign chart. We need to figure out whether this factor will be positive or negative in each interval. So at an x value of 1, this factor will be 0, because 1 minus 1 is 0. So what about a value that's less than 1? For example, if x were 0, we'd have 1 minus 0, which is 1, which is positive. So in this interval, the factor is positive. What about a value that's greater than 1? For example, what about if x was 2? Then we'd have 1 minus 2. That would be negative 1. So in this interval, the factor is negative. So of course, uh, since this is the only factor, um, the fact that uh, 1 minus x is positive makes the overall function positive in this interval. And the fact that it's negative makes the overall function negative. 
usually we, we will have more than one factor so we have to figure out oh we have a positive and a negative so that's a negative so this is a little bit extra simple so we have learned that uh, where f double prime is positive the function will be concave up where f double prime is negative the function will be concave down so that means the original function g will be concave up in this interval and concave down in this interval so let's summarize our answer so we will say g of x is concave up from negative infinity to 1 because g double prime is positive notice how I justify the answer make sure you include this justification and we'll say g of x is concave down from 1 to infinity alright that's from this part of the sign chart because g double prime is negative so let's go through the same steps for problem number 8 however in order to find the first derivative we're gonna need the quotient rule do you know the quotient rule poem low d high less high d low draw the line and down below the bottom squared will go d means derivative so let's do that now low d high the low part means just write down the bottom part so 3x squared plus 1 and then d high means the derivative of the top so that'll be 4x so low d high less high d low high is just 2x squared and d low is the derivative of the bottom part so that will be 6x and that's all because of the one is just a constant draw the line and down below the bottom squared will go so that's the derivative but we will need to clean this up in order to make it more useful multiplied this distributed this and I got this but we have like terms here and here and uh, in fact they cancel each other out so this is the first derivative now it's time to find the second derivative so it looks like we will need the quotient rule again double quotient rule so here we go low d high so for low we just write down the bottom part so that's 3x squared plus 1 squared and then d high the derivative of the bottom of, of the top part so that'll just be 4 so that's low d high less high d low so we just write down the top part and then now we have to take the derivative of the bottom part but man that's going to be the chain rule so here we go d high um, just be emotionally prepared for the chain rule first we have to take the derivative of the outer part so this 2 is going to come into the front so I'm going to have 2 times 3x squared plus 1 okay so there's the derivative of the outer part um, but inside I've got that 3x squared plus 1 but because it has this inner part I need to now multiply by the derivative of the inner part because that's how the chain rule works and the derivative of this green stuff is 6x so low d high less high d low draw the line and down below the bottom squared will go but remember the bottom was already squared so we're gonna have to square it again so we have uh, 3x squared plus 1 it was already squared so when we square it again it'll be to the fourth power so the bottom squared will go this is the second derivative but again we need to clean this up to make it more useful so I took the 3x squared plus 1 squared and I expanded it 
and that gave me 9x to the fourth power plus 6x squared plus 1, which is where this came from. I still need to distribute the 4 on the next step. Over here, I multiplied 4x times 2 times 6x, and that's where the 48x squared came from. I still need to distribute that on the next step. So we distribute and we get this stuff, and now we look for like terms. So I see that we have the uh, 36x to the fourth power minus 144x to the fourth power, and we have 24x squared, which will combine with the negative 48x squared. After combining like terms, we have this. Let's factor out a negative four. I'm noticing that all three of these terms are divisible by four. So far we have this, but I'm really hoping this trinomial is factorable. Let's give it a try. Well, uh, 27 is three times nine. So let's take this first term and split it up as three x squared times nine x squared. Skipping over to the last term, one can only be factored as one times one. To figure out how the signs need to go, you want to think inner plus outer equals middle. Inner, I have these two terms, so that's nine x squared. Outer would be these terms, so that is three x squared. Inner plus outer must equal middle. When I say middle, I'm talking about this term. So the signs need to be negative three and positive nine. So I will get a positive six x squared. But the positive nine will come from having a positive right here for the inner. The negative three x squared will come from the one being negative. So then the outer will be negative one times three x squared, and that will give me the negative three x squared. So this is it, we have factored it. I'm going to do two things on this last step to make this even better. Uh, one thing is we can factor nine x squared minus one as the difference of two squares. So this will become three x plus one times three x minus one. But also, we're going to divide these. So notice that we have a common factor of 3x squared minus, uh, 3x squared plus one right here. When you divide with a common base, you subtract the exponents. So you can think of this as uh, one minus four. So on the next line down, we're going to have four times three x squared plus one to the negative three power. And then like I said, let's go ahead and factor the nine uh, x squared minus one as three x plus one times three x minus one. However, since this is a negative exponent, we should drop this down to the denominator. So after all that work, we have this for the second derivative. Now we need to find the numbers that will make f double prime equal to zero. And we need to find the values that will cause f double prime to be undefined. If this were the first derivative, we would call these critical numbers. But I don't know what to call them when it's the second derivative f double prime will equal zero when the denominator is equal to zero. So looking at this uh, first factor, that means x will equal negative one third. I'm setting this equal to zero and I'm getting negative one third. And looking at the second factor, if I set this equal to zero, I will get positive one third. So these are the two values that will cause the uh, second derivative to equal zero. F double prime will be undefined when the denominator is equal to zero. So setting three x squared plus one equal to zero, maybe I'll show this part. So three x squared plus one would have to equal zero to get the undefined. Uh, so I'm subtracting one and dividing by three. That gives me x squared 
is equal to negative one third. Uh oh. There's no solution here, is there? You can't square something and get a negative number. Or if I took the square root, which would be my next step, I would get an imaginary number. So no solutions here, which means that we just have these two numbers to put on our number line and make the sign chart. So we put these two um, very important numbers on the number line in order. We have three factors to consider, so I will make three rows on this sign chart. Maybe I'll make a fourth row for the negative four. Be sure to label your sign chart as pertaining to F double prime. We need to determine whether each of these factors is positive or negative in each of these intervals. Of course, negative four is always negative, so we can just go ahead and mark negative in all three intervals. But what about three X plus one? If you set this equal to zero and solve, you get negative one third. That means that negative one third is the cutoff. For values that are less than negative one third, you're gonna get a negative result for three X plus one. For example, uh, let's say if X was negative two, then you'd have three times negative two, which would be negative six, plus one would be negative five. For values that are greater than negative one third, you're gonna get a positive result. For example, what if X was zero? Then you would just be left with positive one. What about three X minus one? If you set this equal to zero, you get positive one third. That tells you that positive one third is the cutoff. Um, values of X that are less than one third will give you a negative result for three X minus one. For example, let's use zero again. If you put in zero right here, you would just have negative one. So there's your negative. For values of X that are greater than one third, you're going to get a positive result. So for example, consider um, an X value of one. That would just be three times one. So you have three minus one, which is positive two. Uh, the last factor is really easy. This will always be positive. And it's because we have this x squared in there. When you square something, that's always positive. And then you multiply it by three, still positive. You add one, still positive. So cubing it does not change that. So this is the sign chart. Focus on the negatives in each column. If you have an odd number of negatives, then your overall result is going to be negative. So in this first column, we have three negatives. So that means um, F double prime will be negative when you have this combo. In the second column, we have two negatives. That means that F double prime will be positive in this interval. And in the last column, we have a single negative. So F double prime will be negative in this interval. Remember, we know that where F double prime is positive, the function will be concave up. Where f double prime is negative, the function is concave down. That means the original function will be concave down in this interval and this interval, and it will be concave up in this interval. Here's how you would summarize your answer. Notice that you cannot use a sign chart as a justification. You can't say C sign chart or something like that. You have to say, f of x is concave up from negative one-third to positive one-third because f double prime is positive. Make sure you include that justification. f of x is concave down from negative infinity to negative one-third and also from one-third to infinity because f double prime is negative. All right, let's do one more. Remember, we start with the first derivative. I see we have the quotient rule again. So low d high, less high d low. Low means let's write down the bottom part of the function. So 2x minus 1. d high means take the derivative of the top part. So this will be 2x. So that's low d high, 
less high d low. High is just x squared minus 1. And then d low is the derivative of the bottom part. So that'll just be 2. Draw the line and down below the bottom squared will go. 2x minus 1 squared. Distributing the 2x, I have 4x squared minus 2x. Distributing the 2 and the negative sign, I get minus 2x squared plus 2. Now we need to combine like terms. So we have 4x squared minus 2x squared. That will be 2x squared. That leaves minus 2x and plus 2. All over 2x minus 1 squared. Let's see if we can factor this. Other than taking out a common factor of 2, this trinomial is unfactorable. So let's go on to finding the second derivative. Again, we will do the quotient rule. So low d high. Low is just 2x minus 1 squared. d high. So I'm taking the derivative of this trinomial. That's going to be 4x from the first term and minus 2 from the second term. Nothing from the third term. So that's low d high less high d low. So high, I'm just going to copy down this trinomial. So I'm going to have 2x squared minus 2x plus 2. All right, high d low. So I'm taking the derivative of the bottom part. By the power rule, I'm going to put the 2 in the front. So I'm doing the chain rule, though. So I'm putting the 2 in the front. Uh, because I'm taking the derivative of the outer function, but then we still have this inner part of 2x minus 1. And because there is an inner part, the chain rule says we then have to multiply by the derivative of the inner part, which will simply be 2. So all of this is low d high less high d low. Draw the line and down below, the bottom squared will go. Well, the bottom was already squared, so we're going to square it again and make it fourth power. So we're going to have uh, 2x minus 1 to the fourth power. I need to simplify this to make it usable. One option is to expand everything, just multiply it all out, combine like terms. But with this trinomial in the mix, that would be really tedious. So I'm going to try uh, to avoid that. I want to leverage the fact that we have several factors of 2x minus 1 in here. So let's try to factor that out and maybe cancel and simplify that way. Uh, while I'm doing that, notice that we have a stealth 2x minus 1 factor right here. If you factor out the 2, you have 2 times 2x minus 1. So there's another 2x minus 1. So on my next step, I'm going to do a couple of things. Uh, I will go ahead and combine these. So you're going to see a 4 show up in the front right here. Um, I'm going to combine these. So I have uh, 2x minus 1 squared times another 2x minus 1. So that'll be 2x minus 1 to the third power. So that's what I'm going to do on this step. When all the dust clears, we have this. On the next step, I would like to factor out the common factor in the numerator. So of course, we have the 2x minus 1, which I would like to factor out. But also, notice that we have a 2 and a 4. So we can also factor out a 2. So I'm going to have a common factor of 2 times 2x minus 1 out in the front. So what is that going to leave behind? I've taken out the 2 so that this 2 is gone. 
I've taken away one factor of 2x minus 1. So that's going to leave two factors left behind. So I will have 2x minus 1 squared. I've factored out a 2. So this minus 4 will now become a minus 2. And I've taken this 2x minus 1 completely away. So that's going to leave 2x squared minus 2x plus 2. I've got this factor of 2x minus 1 in the numerator, and then I've got four of those in the denominator. So I'm going to cancel out the factor of 2x minus 1 from the numerator, and I will cancel out one of the factors from the denominator. So on the next step, you're going to see uh, 2x minus 1 cubed in the denominator. I will also go ahead and uh, expand all of this and combine like terms. I expanded the 2x minus 1 squared and got this. I distributed the negative 2 and I got that. So combining like terms, I see we have uh, 4x squared minus 4x squared. So those are gone. And also we have minus 4x and plus 4x. So those are gone. So it'll really just be uh, 1 minus 4. So we have a negative 3 times 2 so we'll have a negative 6 up here. Let's go ahead and talk about the important numbers, which will occur where, uh, what are the values that will cause h double prime to equal 0? Well, that will only happen where the numerator is 0, but that's a constant, so that's not going to happen. So there are no values that will cause the numerator to equal 0. So that just leaves the values that will cause h double prime to be undefined. That will happen when the denominator is equal to 0. So in other words, uh, 2x minus 1 would have to equal 0. But that gives us x equals positive 1 half. So this is the only number that we need to put on our number line to make the sign chart. Here's my one important number sitting here on the number line. I'll make two rows, one for the negative 6 and one for the 2x minus 1 to the third power. Be sure to label your sign chart as pertaining to h double prime. Now we need to determine whether each of these factors is positive or negative in each interval. Of course, negative 6 will be negative in any interval, so we can go ahead and mark that off. What about uh, 2x minus 1? Pick a value that's less than 1 half, like 0. If we put 0 in here, then we just have negative 1. Cube it, it's still negative. So values less than 1 half will cause this factor to be negative. Values greater than 1 half will cause this to be positive. Um, not convinced, go ahead and pick a value bigger than 1 half, like positive 1. This would be 2 times 1, which would be 2. Minus 1 would be 1. Cubit, you still have a positive 1. Look at the overall result. A negative times a negative would be a positive, and a negative times a positive would be a negative. Well, I, technically, I guess I should say a negative divided by a negative is a positive, and a negative divided by a positive is a negative. Remember that we know when f double prime is positive, then f is concave up. When f double prime is negative, f is concave down. That tells us that the original function h will be concave up on this interval from negative infinity to 1 half and it will be concave down on this interval from 1 half to infinity. Let's summarize our answer and include justifications. We'd say h of x is concave up from negative infinity to 1 half because h double prime is positive. Also, h of x is concave down from 1 half to infinity because h double prime is negative. 